Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Form Check Friday. This is, of course, the series where we take your user-submitted videos, viewer-submitted videos, rather, uh, we toss them up on the screen behind me, and I do my very best to offer you all some fantastic technique advice. Um, and for the most part, our comments, even, are filled with technique advice for whoever sort of we end the episode on. Um, and with that being said, we're going to dive four words into Levon. Uh, now, Levon, we left off with Levon last episode, obviously, and uh, had some great comments uh, about different ways that Levon could fix his deadlift. He says he's been deadlifting about two months, started with conventional, um, but uh, switched to sumo, or sorry, switch started with sumo. My apologies. He started with sumo because he found it more enjoyable, and he said it looks more cool, which Levon, I could not personally agree with anymore. Um, but he wants to get his technique dialed in. He's, uh, he says he's worried he's adding weight a little bit too slowly. Now, honestly, I think that most beginners will, will sort of err in the other direction and start adding weight too quickly. So I think you've actually maybe done yourself a favor by not adding weight too quickly here, Levon. Um, in terms of the deadlift, number one, it looks like we're pulling from uh, a bit of a disadvantage here, right? It looks like these might be 35s or, or of a smaller diameter than where you would be pulling like a comp plate from. Um, so it might be worthwhile to get some kind of small blocks or mats or something like that, um, or just use a larger diameter plate. Now I could be wrong here, you could just be a really tall guy making this bar look small, but uh, yeah, it does look like you're, you're pulling from a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, in terms of your starting position, honestly, I think things look quite good. So at this point, you pulled yourself into a really good position. I think perhaps we're a little bit too hips low and a little bit too extended. Now those are obviously two things that I will cue people to do relentlessly on this show, but there is such a thing as uh, sort of overcorrecting and, and going past uh, a helpful point to, okay, now we're overdoing some of these cues. And I think that often happens with the sumo deadlift. So what I would like from you, Levon, is I'd like to see a little bit more ribs down bracing. So instead of this kind of angle, I'd like to see a, a more straight angle with the back. And I also think you could allow the hips to start from just a tiny little bit higher position, which is gonna help bring the, the knees back a little bit more in line, uh, and a little bit more sort of straight vertical. <laughs> Uh, when you're starting your pull. So you can see you actually make it off the floor pretty cleanly here, but we do actually see the hips kind of pick up a little bit behind you in order for you to break it off the floor. And that really sort of tough initial phase of the deadlift till we get to the knees is exaggerated by the fact that we're so low in the hips. Now if we look at this second pull, this to me actually looks a little bit better. So we're a little bit more neutral here. We've got the hips at a little bit of a higher joint angle, right? Whereas this first pull, we're sitting a lot lower and then we kind of default back into that position. So what I would say is we should try starting in this position so we're not starting in a different position and shifting into this one, if that makes sense. Start position is really, really, really important with the sumo deadlift. Uh, and I think once we get the start position nailed in, the rest of the lift starts to make a lot more sense. Now the next thing I'm noticing here is your footwear. And these look like some pretty standard runners, sneakers, trainers, whatever you call them, depending on where in the world you come from. Um, but what I would do is I would, I would actually just ditch shoes for now. And I would have you just in socks and see if lifting just in socks with that little bit less distance between your foot and the ground helps, um, as well as these soles of these kinds of shoes can be really squishy uh, and can contribute to a little bit of a, a balance issue in a lot of cases. So you can, you can often feel the ground a little bit better uh, and have better sensation through your feet in terms of how your balance is distributed by ditching those shoes. Now, it looks like you're doing a pretty darn good job of your upper back, so I think if you can get your hip height dialed in, perhaps um, hips a little bit higher and a little bit more of a, a sort of neutralized back angle as opposed to being quite so extended, uh, I think you're gonna be in a really good spot there. Our next lift comes from Kiara, I believe, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, Kiara, yeah. Now, before we go into Kiara, I wanna let everybody know, um, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. If you're watching and you're not subscribed, consider leaving us a, a subscribe, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, we, we did the analytics on the last video and it's like 55% of the people watching the video are not subscribed. So go ahead and hit that little red button. We got a lot more than just form checks on the channel. Uh, take a look through, we have a ton of great informational content. So give us a sub, you know? Uh, we're getting really close to 100K and uh, it would be really cool if we broke that mark. So anyways, enough of that. Let's talk about Kiara. So 
Kara says she spent two and a half years lifting now. Um, she says she's always kind of struggled with her squat technique. This is a set of five at 75%, um, and she's worried that her, her mobility isn't very good. So she says her biggest issue is the heels coming up, not hitting depth. Uh, and, and she says she'd really like to compete, but she's afraid of injuring herself uh, in terms of like pushing her training and, and being a little bit more aggressive with what she's putting on the bar. Um, she says she wears heels, but only a small heel and, and has a bigger heel. So she says she's using the power lifts right now for shoes um, and that she has a pair of the uh, Romaleo fours, I believe, which have a higher heel. So if you know anything about weightlifting shoes, the power lifts are about a half inch effective heel. And the Romaleos, uh, I think of any generation, are three quarter inch heels. So I, I personally use the Romaleos. Now, the thing about heel height, before we get into the squat, is that if, if you're a power lifter and that's your main sort of athletic pursuit, you're not doing yourself a disservice by using tools that allow you to get into good positions. A lot of like weird functional gurus uh, that think that like human movement as a spectrum needs to be strictly defined by having excessive range of motion in every single tiny little capacity uh, might say otherwise. But my professional opinion is that if you can wear a higher heel and it allows you to squat better and pursue the thing that you really love to do, then do that. Right, and that's not to not to say that you're you're foolish for having not come to this conclusion yet, but I, I honestly think that uh, you use the words masking the issue here. You didn't want to mask the issue, um, and I think with some technique advice, which I'll give you in just a sec, I think it's not going to be a, a real issue. I don't think your mobility is bad. Uh, I think aside from the shoes, like use the ROM fours if you squat better in them, 100%. Just just do it. Um, in terms of the actual squat itself, like your, your setup, your, your bracing, your position with your trunk and your bar, your shelf, everything is so good. The only thing is that when you're squatting, you very much come down and forward like this. So what I would recommend is, is perhaps some pause squats, some pin squats, some tempo squats, different squat variations to help you learn different segments and portions of the movement in, in sort of an isolated fashion. Um, but the biggest thing that we're gonna need to try to figure out is how to sit back a little more into the squat, right? So if we watch this, you kind of definitely come down and forward, uh, and then we're running into like the sort of maximum angle we're gonna get here. Uh, so it's less about your, your ankle not having enough mobility and more about you just needing to sit back more, keep more pressure on your heel, uh, and, and almost like reach your hips behind you and down towards the floor back this way. Uh, another thing that I've used with a lot of lifters and, and um, you know, all the, all the very strict raw lifters, the USAPL um, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, ideology uh, coaches and trainers and lifters are, are going to crucify me for this one, but I would say box squats. I've used box squats very effectively um, with very incredible lifters to great extent uh, and, and to great usefulness in simply learning to like reach back a little bit. Now I might utilize the box squat a little bit different than uh, than a lot of other coaches uh, have in the past or historically. What I would do is I would get a box that ensures that you're going to squat all the way to depth. And I would simply use it as a cue for you to reach back, an external cue for you to reach your squat back, for you to keep that weight on your heels all the way into the bottom. I wouldn't have you sit back and relax and do some of those kinds of things that maybe have been popularized by um, more like west side style approaches. But what I would have is just, just toss a box back there, sit back to it as a means for you to get your hips back and to keep that bar a little bit over midfoot, right? Right now that bar is coming over the forefoot, which is causing you to tip forward, run into mobility restrictions that otherwise I don't think would exist. So in that sense, um, I think go ahead and use the shoes. We need to learn to sit back and that's going to fix depth easily. Uh, like I don't think you have a whole lot of restrictions. I think you just have a tendency to want to go forward when you squat. You just have to sit back. And, and box squats, pin squats, pause squats, tempo squats, any of these variations. Play around a little bit and see if you can find one that when you film keeps you back a little bit. Keeps you on your heels a little bit. Um, and, and boom. Like, there you go. Your squat, other than that, is great. So uh, don't get discouraged. Don't think that you can't compete. Don't think you're going to hurt yourself because you're not. Your squat technique is very good. And honestly, the link between technique and injury risk is its a tough one to, to really create a, a, a causal link between. It, it's just not quite there in the literature. Um, so, yeah. I think you have a great basis to build off of here and I think you can absolutely compete, so so go get it. All right, 
Um, this next one is Lawrence. Um, now, Lawrence says he's been facing a, a, a two-year plateau on his bench. He says he's been stuck at 235 pounds on his bench for two years. Uh, he says he's really working on leg drives, trying to contribute more with his legs into his arch here. Um, and he says that this is his first time benching with a pad under his back, so the, the yoga mat here. Uh, one of the reasons people do that is because these commercial benches tend to be really slippery. So when we're powerlifting, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to set up the upper back where we're pulling the shoulder blades back towards one another, we're pulling the shoulder blades down to drive the chest up, we're trying to create this like decline advantageous position. And we do all of that, and then if the bench is really slippery, we kind of just slip right out of that, and it's, it's not ideal. So I'm all for using something like this. Uh, one thing you can do is buy a yoga mat and then cut off a piece this big. Just keep it in your gym gym bag. Take it with you, toss it down on the on the, the bench, pick it back up when you're done, and away you go. Now, let's take a look at the actual bench itself. So. Uh, yeah, he says he's just trying to get more leg drive and is wondering if there's anything in his technique that you know is is contributing to him being stuck. Now the other unfortunate uh, circumstance or the uh, sort of unfortunate outcome of having these commercial benches is that it really looks like you're having to reach, you're really having to like protract your shoulder to get this bar out of the rack. So if you can, I would get a little further back. Uh, looks like you've got somebody spotting for you here. So if you can get them to give you a little bit more assistance out of the rack, so you can keep your shoulders protracted more and kind of almost more skull crusher it out of the rack as opposed to having to pop your shoulders out. Very big difference there. That can help with the unrack. But let's take a look at the actual lift itself. So at this point, you should be regaining some of that position you lost. Because you unracked, like I said, from a very protracted position, shoulders forward. Protraction refers to the movement of the shoulder blades like this on the back of your rib cage, forwards, right? Retraction is this way, elevation is shrugging up, depression is, shru is, is the anti-shrug. Depression is the shoulder blade movement down towards your butt. And the two that we want in the bench press are retraction and depression. We want shoulders back and down. Now, when we unrack the bar with a really protracted position, we'll often have a hard time getting back into that retracted position because now all of a sudden there's, uh, I don't know, 170 pounds bearing down on this on this bar. So get some help from your, your handoff person unracking. And then once you've unracked it, retighten that back, regain that lost position. In terms of the bench itself, it looks really good. It's, it's obviously touch and go. So I think there are going to be considerations that are going to need to be made for, you know, uh, exercise variation. Um, and I think one of the reasons, that the, the biggest reason that it looks like you're probably plateauing here, Lawrence, is, is, is more than likely programming. Now, when we see these extended plateaus and we see the lifter and their technique is totally fine or even passable, most of the time, it's a lack of, of programming knowledge. In some cases, lifters aren't even tracking their programming. I went back to the gym for the first time the other day and talked to some people and I was like, dude, like you look huge. Your, your, your lifting looks like it's going crazy on Instagram. And he's like, oh yeah, I just started like keeping a log of my training. So in a lot of cases, it's as simple as that. Now, the thing that I'm gonna recommend or, or you know, more broadly recommend here is the Calgary Barbell Training app. So. We have an app wherein you have a training log, a place to host all your videos. You'll have suggested loads. Uh, according to RPEs, there's a built-in auto-regulating and learning RPE chart that's gonna help you decide what weight to put on the bar given you know whatever program you're using. And it also has a very robust program library that's consistently growing. It's a subscription-based service and you have access to all of the programs as they continue to come out. And you also have access to our private Discord where I go in literally every morning and offer form check advice like this to everybody who posts their videos in there. So if you're interested in something like that, you can head to calgarybarbell.programs.app and check that out. Uh, I think one of the ways a lot of these lifters can get ahead is definitely by using uh, a programming resource like that. So I think the biggest thing here is programming. Now, let's say Lawrence is, uh, is not gonna do the programming app, right? And, and I'm not just saying, okay, the only way to get better is to go get our app, brother. Um, in this case, what I would do is I would, I would try to increase your bench press frequency. I would implement some paused benches. I would mess around with different grips, different grip widths. You know, there's the, the ongoing meme on our channel is that I always tell people to grip wider. A lot of the times that helps. Um, but start messing around with your programming. And, and honestly, to literally everybody out there watching this, 
this is my message. If you are not tracking your training or, or, or writing it down in a book or tracking it literally anywhere, just, just start there. The one thing you can do to guarantee you will make more progress is literally just track your training. I, d I didn't realize this was a thing people still didn't do. Track your training. Please, for the love of gains, track your training. Ideally, you know, ideally track it in the calgarybarbell.programs.app, uh, Calgary Barbell Training app. But anyways, um, so there you go, Lawrence. Some tips with, for, for programming there. All right. Up next is Casey. So Casey said she was a sumo puller. Um, she started running into knee and abductor pain. So when we're talking about abductors and adductors, we're generally talking about the muscles on the inside and the outside of the femur. The abductors abduct and move the, the femurs or the knees away from the midline of the body. The adductors, A-D-D, adductors, add back towards the midline. Sorry, basic A and P there. Um, so anyways, Casey ran into some issues with pain uh, in her knee and her abductors. Uh, and she said she feels much better with conventional. She said she feels stronger, she feels more confident. So I'm not gonna use this as a like, oh, you just didn't transition properly and uh, you know, you should go back to Suma. Like that's not the angle I'm gonna take here. So um, she says she feels way better with conventional. Uh, she wants to start going heavy, but she's just not certain that her technique is good enough. So there's another sort of common I don't know, myth or myth, myth, myth conception uh, in there that I, I want to take a, a second to dispel. And that is that like, if your technique isn't perfect, you can't go heavy. And I think that if your technique is generally passable and you don't like hurt all the time, you probably can go heavier. It's okay. Right. Um, I, I think we, we've sort of built this culture again of like ascribing a lot of danger to heavy lifting. And, and while certainly if you lift very light, you know, you're probably not going to run into any kind of injury issue at all. Um, there's been some interesting studies about doing less work actually leading to more injuries and having a sort of sweet spot where you have to do a certain amount of work um, and doing less work than that could be potentially more injurious. Anyways, um, but I think that the main thing I'm going to say is that we don't always have to wait until the technique is absolutely perfect to go heavy. Sometimes we should just put some weight on the bar and lift the weight and get strong and feel good. So anyways, um, I digress. The, the interesting thing here, Casey, is I'd, I'd love to see this deadlift from the front because I think one of the biggest issues people make with the sumo, uh, or sorry, the sumo, the conventional, is we'll take a, a really narrow grip. So if we're looking at this from the front and here's your arms uh, and here's the bar, one of the things we'll see is that if your hips are a little more wide set outside of here, we'll see the knees actually have to come inwards, right, to be inside of the arms. So when we have this kind of like internally rotated angle at the hip, in a lot of cases, it makes for technical inefficiencies. So I would be cautious uh, or, or not cautious. I would, I would film your lifts from the front, see if you're what I call crowding your knees. And if you are, I would bring your stance in a little bit and or move your grip out a little bit to make sure that if we look at you from the front, your, your knee is pretty much straight in front of your hip as opposed to being inside of your hips right, with your grip being a restricting factor. So if you bring your stance in, in some cases, that allows us to be a little bit more straight up and down. But uh, oftentimes it's the grip needing to move outwards. Now, looking at what we have here, right, because we have this deadlift from the side, so let's take a look. I think that overall we're doing a pretty damn good job, um, especially of pulling the slack out of the bar. It's, it's not the sort of usual way I would recommend pulling the slack out of the bar. A lot of the times I'll tell people to lift their hips up, find a good sort of stiff legged position to build tension in the hamstrings, start using the quads, pull the hips down and do sort of all of that sequence to pull the slack out of the bar. But it looks like you're doing a really good job kind of pulling the slack out of the bar from this already sort of bent down position. The only thing I'm going to say is when you when you go to lock out, it looks like you're really trying to like keep your ribs down and almost bring your pelvis up this way towards you. And I would say, go ahead and pull with your lats through the lockout as well, right? Stand nice and tall at the lockout. Don't be afraid to pull back a little bit with your back at the top. Now, obviously a lot of people will, uh, I've seen this in the comments. I see this in the, in the discords and, and all that kind of stuff all the time. People seem to be really worried about overextending at the top of the deadlift. And I think that's maybe less of a concern than a lot of people think. Um, in most cases, it's just kind of unnecessary, right? Cause we only need the lockout to, you know, shoulders over hips basically. 
So I would say you can lock out maybe a tiny, tiny bit further. That's all I'm getting at. The other thing, when you lock out, watch those knees. We want to make sure we're keeping the knees straight and locked and fully extended. So think about using your quads. Think about keeping your quads active and having them participating in the lift all the way through. Now beyond that, uh, I think you do a great job with back position. Uh, I think again, like your lockouts are nice and smooth. Um, we're nice and smooth off the floor, which is something I really harp on people a lot for is like jerking into the bar off the floor. I think you do a great job of being smooth. And like I said, pulling the slack out of the bar. Um, so overall looks great. Uh, hopefully there are some tips and pieces of advice for you in there that allow you to continue to make progress and uh, give you the confidence to put a little bit more weight on the bar. Cause that's what we're all after, right? There's more weight on the bar. All right. Uh, Jose here says he's 17. Um, he's spent about six months lifting. Uh, he says he's from Vancouver, so shout outs to Vancouver if you're watching this. Um, and he says he has troubles with depth. He says his hips bother him when he hits depth, and this is his third working set of 275 for six. So, one of the biggest things that we talk about consistently, when people run into issues with depth, and when people talk about hip pain or hip discomfort at depth, one of the first things we will look at almost every time is stance width. So stance width is something that can impact your ability to get to depth because of the way that your hips are shaped, more or less. So for some people, you'll see them squatting very, very wide. For others, you'll see them squatting very, very narrow. Others will be, you know, most people are gonna be kind of somewhere in between those two extremes, but if we're squatting, what I, what I would consider quite narrow here, relatively toed out, and we're getting, I don't know, maybe an inch or two above depth still, right? Like we're not that close to depth. Uh, this, this angle is, is betraying you a little bit. It's making it look a little bit higher than it is, but this is still definitely a high squat. Honestly, my man, Jose, just bring that stance out a bit. That's my number one tip for you. Uh, looks like you're doing a pretty damn good job with the upper back. Looks like you're you're holding the shelf really well. Looks like you're, you're you're keeping a good brace throughout the lift. Now all that might change once we start getting actual depth, but the biggest thing is I think I think we're kind of like running into ourselves. We're we're having some issues with that hip joint getting any more flexion because our our stance is too narrow. And I think if we widen that stance up, I think you're gonna have a way easier time getting depth. I think it's gonna be a lot more comfortable. Now the, the caveat here is that if you want more depth, you're likely going to have to reduce the weight. This was a hard lesson that I learned early on in my training career. I used to do, here's, here's a funny story, funny anecdote for everybody. I used to do, I used to have two different days where I would, or sorry, I used to have two different squat exercises on my squat day. My first exercise, squats. My second exercise, deep squats. And it wasn't until I did my deep squats that I would actually go to depth. So I thought I was king shit. Uh, I thought I was squatting um, like 205, 210 kilos for sets of five and six. Uh, I, I thought I was the best squatter. Now, the first time I tested my maxes, I thought, okay, well, if I'm gonna test maxes and call this like a legitimate max, luckily I had some, some actually sound logic in here. Uh, if I'm gonna test this and call it a max, I'm gonna have to go all the way down, right? Like I need to get good depth. And I actually ended up squatting about 100 pounds less than I thought I was going to in this max test because I was actually hitting depth. So long story short, what I'm saying is that when you add, you know, two to four inches onto your range of motion, you might find things get unorganized, things get loose, things get hard to stay braced. And that just means, okay, like, let's keep it peeled back a little bit in terms of the load on the bar for as long as it takes for us to get comfortable and build efficiency and resiliency and practice that full range of motion. So yeah, there's my, there's my little rant complete, complete with the, uh, with the story making fun of me for squatting high. Cause I used to, uh, people squatting high don't need to be ridiculed. They need to be helped. And, and honestly, uh, yeah. Let's, let's just be open and welcoming to people who are, who are putting a bar on their back and bending their knees, right? Uh, Cam. All right, so Cam is doing some bench press here. Cam is from Australia. So shout outs to Australia. Uh, yes, I will say it like that every time. Um, so he, Cam recently did a 1RM attempt on the bench and um, went for a two and a half kilo PR. It did not go how he wanted. 
and he spent, uh, I think, previous to his 1RM attempt and getting back into training here, I think he said he's he recently sustained a, an injury, spent about two years rehabbing his shoulder, so you can imagine what kind of a pain in the ass that is. Uh, this set he's showing us here is 110 kilos for a set of five. Now the first rep is comp and the rest are touch and go. So Cam's wondering, um, number one, you know, what sorts of technical things he can do better with his bench press. And number two, what sorts of variations uh, can help. So I want everybody to go down in the comments section below, leave us uh, uh, some advice for Cam, but also I wanna know what, what bench variations that people like doing. For, for anybody out there who's suffered through a bench plateau, what got you through it? What, what helped you come past uh, some kind of plateau? And maybe we don't need to restrict it to bench, but let's talk about bench for now. What helped you get past a bench plateau? And I will start off next episode um, by talking a little bit about how I broke a two, three, I don't even know how many year plateau. Um, and, uh, and we can talk a little bit about exercise selection. We can talk about some things like maybe hypertrophy, weight gain. Um, and yeah, let, it, let me know. Let me know what worked for all of y'all out there. And we will leave it at that. So we will see everybody next week. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. I see you. You're still watching. Hit it. Just a little click, a little click. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>